What is up everyone? Today on the show, we're going to talk about how to tell if organic molecules are polar. Organic molecules contain mostly carbon and hydrogen, and they're the subject of organic chemistry. So it's pretty common to move from general chemistry to organic chemistry, and you still have to determine if molecules are polar or not. Turns out this is actually way easier than it was in Gen Chem. So here's what we're going to do in this lesson. First, I'm going to give you a quick and easy rule to spot polar organic molecules. It'll take you 30 seconds to learn and get you the right answer in 98% of the cases or more. Then we'll explain the quick and easy rule. And lastly, we'll talk about some important exceptions. Okay, first up, the quick and easy rule. Organic molecules are generally polar if they contain anything other than carbon and hydrogen. So just carbon and hydrogen means nonpolar. Anything else? That's polar. That's almost always right. So here we have butane. It contains four carbons, one, two, three, four, and the hydrogen's on them. So just carbon and hydrogen. And that means this guy is going to be nonpolar. On the other hand, we now see on the second molecule a chlorine tacton. As soon as we get that chlorine tacton, that chlorine, because it's electronegative, makes this molecule polar. Now, to make the rule a little more specific, I'll tell you what it is that you'll typically see on organic molecules that make it polar. Organic molecules are generally polar if they contain nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, or sulfur. That's a long list. How can you remember it? Well, it makes a nice seven on the periodic table. And actually, those are exactly the same as the diatomic molecules that always are uh, diatomic. So N always comes as N2 and O always comes as O2. And then we just tack on sulfur. So pretty easy to remember those exact atoms. Uh, to be honest, anytime you see something that's not carbon or hydrogen, it's almost always one of those anyway. So the, the first version of the rule is totally legit. And let's go ahead and practice and apply that to a bunch of different molecules. Here's all we're going to do. We're going to look and see if we can spot something that's not carbon or hydrogen. If it has anything that's not carbon or hydrogen, then it's probably polar. So we look at molecule one, we see that it has bromine, and because it has bromine, we're going to say, hey, you know what, that's polar. Then we look at molecule two, it has some double bonds, but still only carbon and hydrogen, and so that's going to be non-polar. We look at molecule three, benzene, it has those double bonds alternating around that ring, but still only carbon and hydrogen, so it's going to be non-polar. We get to molecule four, and a molecule like this can really throw people off because it's written as a condensed structure, but still we just kind of scan through and we see, hey, you know what, there's only carbon and hydrogen there, so that's still going to be nonpolar. Let's go to molecule five. On molecule five, we see, oh, there's an oxygen, and guess what? It's going to be polar. On molecule six, we see a sulfur and a hydrogen, and guess what? That's going to be polar. In molecule seven, we once again see OH, so that's going to be polar. And then on molecule eight, we have a condensed structure again, but notice at the very end, we have a chlorine snuck on there. And so that's something that's not carbon or hydrogen, and so it's going to be polar. All right, so this rule is super easy and almost always right. Let's talk about why it's right. Remember that a polar molecule requires a polar bond and asymmetry. Here's the thing, though. Because organic molecules are large, they're almost always asymmetrical. They have different terminal atoms all over the place. So, for example, if we take a look here at the molecule on the left, we got some chlorines here, and then we got carbons floating around in other places, and we have hydrogens floating around in other places. And this is just kind of the norm for an organic molecule where you have all sorts of different atoms on your carbons. Okay, so because you have different terminal atoms, you have that asymmetry in almost all cases. So basically, when we think about these requirements, asymmetry is almost always there. It basically means we don't need to think about it. One really important exception here is this guy. It's got four chlorines on a single carbon. That's called tetrachloromethane. Okay, tetrachloromethane has four chlorines, and it actually does have symmetry. So this is one really important exception. It doesn't come up super often, but it is an organic solvent that you'll see. And it's really important to remember that this guy, despite having chlorine, is nonpolar. Okay, so that's one really important exception. But in general, general, our molecules have asymmetry. And because they have asymmetry, all we really have to look for is the polar bond. And the thing is, is that if you have carbon bonded to oxygen, nitrogen, fluorine, bromine, chlorine, iodine, or sulfur, it's a polar bond. So that's why this rule works so well. It's basically if you have one of these atoms floating around in your organic molecule, it's going to make a polar bond, and we almost always have asymmetry, so it's good. All right, last up, let's just talk about two important caveats. We already talked about one of them. This guy is the only organic molecule that you'll see floating around relatively often that contains non-carbon or hydrogen that's actually nonpolar. So really important to remember that. So tetrachloromethane is nonpolar. All right, now... This molecule, if we look at it and we say, hey, is it polar or nonpolar? 
Well, we see the oxygen, right? So you're going to say, hey, that's polar. And that's actually technically the correct answer. But once we get really long carbon chains, it's important to remember that our molecules can sort of take on properties of polar and nonpolar at the same time. Because what we really have is up here at this oxygen and hydrogen, we have kind of a polar end. And that technically makes the whole molecule polar. But the rest of the molecule on the left-hand side is just carbon and hydrogen, which makes this region nonpolar. And the bigger our molecules get, the more they can start to take on characteristics that are both polar and nonpolar. And you have to start thinking about the region of the molecule you're looking at and the property you're interested in to understand if it's polar or nonpolar and why that matters. So for example, this guy is considered polar because it has a polar group, but it's not miscible in water because it has all that carbon and hydrogen. Okay, so those are just two important caveats. One, you will just want to remember that tetrachloromethane is in fact nonpolar. And the other is that as your molecules get really large, we're going to need to think about that more carefully. And that'll be the subject of a later video. Thanks for watching this episode of Real Chemistry.